482.
scripture reading and prayer 970. 970. Joshua 24, verses 15. Joshua 24, verses 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.
and, and get it, and so we can have the, we can put be the whole armor of God. We might put that on. We might stand up against the wiles of the evil. Father, we thank you for all the blessings you bless us with. And you ask you to forgive us many sins. Jesus, and we pray. Amen. 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 For the Lord's Supper, 452. 452. <clears throat> During this song, someone will be going by if you need the emblems, if you would just let them know. Night with them. As we prepare to meet around our Lord's table and partake of this supper which He instituted, may we have our minds on who sent the Son, what He did, and who received the atonement. Let us look at Romans, the fifth chapter. We'll start with the first verse. We will know that this fifth chapter is a continuation of the thought of the Apostle Paul that we must grasp faith in God. That we must abide by what Jesus taught us in, his, in the Word. And then let's look and see in these verses how the death of Jesus paved the way, the only way that exists for a path for you and I to be with God for eternity. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. I'm sorry, I apologize. Which is, which is given unto us for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. His death at Calvary, the suffering that he endured for you and I. God has granted us the ability through, through Christ, his blood shed there at Calvary <clears throat> to attain the hope through obedience and faith to his word. May we always be thankful for that. May we commit our lives to serving him who has loved us and given himself for us. Let us have a prayer for the bread. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this Lord's Supper. We are so thankful for the privilege to partake of it, Father. Father, as we partake of this loaf, may we see his body yonder on that terrible, cruel cross at Calvary. May we see the pain and anguish and penalty he went through to have the sins of the world placed upon him. But he gave himself freely. He gave himself freely because he loves us. You sent him because you love us. Oh, Father, we know. We know he was crucified there. We thank you for your love for us. And as we partake of this loaf, may we know it, it is representative of his body given there. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let us have a prayer for the fruit of the vine. Almighty God in heaven, as we approach your majestic throne of grace, the one and only God who has always been and always will be, forever and ever and ever, thank you for precious Jesus, the blood he shed there. And as we partake of this fruit of the vine, may we remember May we think about it. 
May we ponder and meditate upon it, Father. The tremendous love that you have in the giving of precious Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. While that concludes the Lord's Supper, we now move into another part of worship, which is giving. Let us have a prayer for the contribution. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this first day of the week. Father, we know that we are simply following your will when we meet on the first day of the week because the early church from the day of Pentecost on, Father. The sign of the first day of the week where we come together and worship you in faith and in spirit. And we know that, that giving is a part of that worship that's only for the Lord's day. Father, we pray that as we give, we will understand and know assuredly how you have blessed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, Mark 337. 337 will be the song of encouragement. For the lesson, number 282. 282. Let's all stand while we sing. <coughs> I know.
Well, I am so glad that you are here this morning. We have a good crowd, and that's partly due to our visitors, and we're thankful that you are here. You know, when you think about this world that we live in, there are a lot of choices that we have to make, aren't there? Some choices are quite involved and complicated choices. Uh, if you were in a position where you were going to have to buy a new place to live, you would be inundated with the choices, wouldn't you? You'd have to ask yourself, well, what kind of, uh, what kind of home am I looking for? Do I want a single family home or maybe a townhouse or a condo? And then once you made your mind up uh, uh, on that, you'd have to say, well, I want to live in a single family house, but then what kind of neighborhood do I want to live in? Do I want to live in a subdivision or maybe out in the country or maybe on a farm or a homestead? And then when you made that choice, you'd have to say, well, what kind of house do I want to look for? A brick home or, a, you know, a home with vinyl siding or maybe a log cabin? There'd be all kinds of choices that you'd have to make. And if you were in a similar position with buying a car, you'd have a ton of choices you'd have to make, wouldn't you? You'd have to say, first of all, what kind of brand, uh, you know, car am I going to buy? you got everything from... Accurate a Volkswagen and every letter in between almost. And you, you'd have to narrow down your choices maybe to the make that you want. And then you say, well, now you've got to look at all the models that that, uh, that company makes. Do I want a truck or an SUV or a car, a compact, a sports car? And then when you make that up in your mind, now you got a thousand colors to choose from and trim packages and where you're going to buy it from. It's just a ton of choices that you have to make. It's so complicated sometimes uh, just, to, just to make it through the normal kinds of choices that we have to make in this life. But the good news is, even though some choices are quite complicated, there are some that are very simple. And that's what I want to preach about this morning, the simple choices that we make in life. Now, I don't want you to confuse simple choices with easy choices. Because just because something is simple doesn't mean that it's easy. <laughs> you know, sometimes there are two choices that we have to face in our life, and the choice is still very difficult because we know that if we make this choice and it has this consequence, if we make that choice and it has a whole other set of consequences. And so there are lots of simple choices that aren't easy choices, but they are simple because there's, they're binary in nature. That's either this or that. It's not like you're looking at cars where there's, you know, 20 different makes and 50 different models and 100 different colors and, you know, 10 different trim packages for each car. It's not like that. It's simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. I appreciate uh, that scripture that was read for us uh, this morning from Joshua chapter 24, where Joshua said, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. And he talked about some of the false gods that were being served in that time, in that area. But then he said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see how simple a choice that is? You got false gods on one hand, you got the one true and living God on the other hand. Very simple choice. Now, there are consequences. You choose the false gods, you can basically live any way you want to live. But you're not going to receive any blessings in this life, and you're certainly going to be punished in the next life. But then there's the one true God, and God makes a lot of requirements out of you. You have to live His way if you want to get blessings, and ultimately you can go to heaven when this life is over. And so it's a simple choice, but not an easy choice. And life is filled with those too. And that's what I want to talk about. Number one, it's a simple choice that we have to make whether we want to walk by faith or walk by our own opinions. Man, are we an opinionated bunch in this country. We have a lot of choices, a lot of different ideas about things, a lot of different opinions. And some of them, all of them, I suppose, in the realm of opinion, are fine. Some, some people like Chevys, and some like Fords, and some like uh, Toyotas, and they're not going to change about that. Well, that's fine. Buy whatever you want. You're allowed to have your own opinion about things like that. Where you want to live, and what kind of job you want to have. 
Those fall in the realm of judgment. And, you, and somebody might say, well, I think it's a lot smarter to work this kind of job than that kind of job. Well, that's your opinion. And you don't, your opinion is not authority on that. And so you choose whatever you want. But there are some things, my friends, that do not fall into the realm of opinion. Spiritual things, things that God has already decided on, do not fall in the realm of opinion. Those things are matters of faith. And we don't get our own opinions when it comes to the things that God's already spoken about. I'm reminded of passages like Romans 10, verse number 17, where the Bible says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There's only one way that we have faith produced in our lives, and the only kind of saving faith that we can have is produced by God's word, what he says. And so when we study it and we read it in the Bible, then that settles it. I know what the Bible says, but. How many times have you heard that when you talk with people in the world? I know what the Bible says, but here's what I think. You know what, friends? It does. Respectfully, it doesn't matter what you think. Amen. It doesn't matter what I think either. When God says something, that settles it. And that puts the choice in our hands, doesn't it? What kind of life am I going to choose? Am I going to choose a life that is lived by an objective standard? God gives us his word and that is to Christians the law that we live by. Somebody says, well, the government has a lot of rules too. Well, that's true. But the apostle said in Acts 5 verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, I know that Romans teaches us that we need to respect our government, and that is true, unless they legislate where God has already spoken. And in that case, if they differ from what God says, we have to focus on what God says. That is where our allegiance lies. And so we are guided by this book. But now there are a lot of people that haven't made that choice yet. And they're guided by the whims of society and the pressures of the world, and most importantly, what they like and don't like. You know, it's great when our wills line up with God's wills. God's will lines up with our will. That's not really the test, though. God says, treat one another like family. And you say, good, I'm glad God said that because I like treating people like family. God says, be there at every service. And we say, good, because I want to be there every time the door is open. That's not the real <clears throat> test. The test is when God says something that we don't like. When God says something and we have a different opinion. That's when your submission to God's will is really tested. There's a lot of people in this world, probably the vast majority, even of religious people, that are just allowing their religion to be guided by what they like and what they don't like. Their opinions versus God's will. It's a very simple choice, but it's a hard one sometimes to make. <laughs> because as we said, when you decide to do what God says, it means a whole different way of life. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, the Bible says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Walking by faith means doing what God says, that which he has revealed to us through his written down system of faith, Amen. Christianity. And we have to make up our minds, don't we? Religiously, we've got to walk by faith and not walk by sight, which is walking by our own desires, our own opinions, our own likes and dislikes. Number two, the choice that we make that is very simple but not always easy is what kind of person am I going to be? What kind of category am I going to fall into? Am I going to fall into the category of people in this world that are wicked, or am I going to strive to be righteous? And somebody says, well, none of us are righteous because none of us are sinful and perfect. Well, that's true. <clears throat> but there is sort of an arc to our life, isn't there? There's sort of, a, there's sort of a, a trajectory that we're on in our lives. And when you look around, you can see what trajectory people are on. You look around and you can say, oh, that person's spiraling. 
You can see it in people's lives when they're making terrible choices and hanging around the wrong kind of people. And you can say, you know, the proverbial car crash is coming. There's going to be a problem in that person's life because the arc of their life is headed in the wrong direction. Well, that's a person who's given themselves over to lasciviousness and wickedness and uh, lewdness and they're doing what they want to do. But then on the other hand, sometimes there you see people who are making improvements. They're doing better because they're following what the Bible says and they're doing what God says to do. And they're on a different kind of trajectory. It's, it's a very simple choice that we make. Do I want to be better? Do I want to be worse? I suppose nobody ever really verbalizes it that way. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I really want to be worse today. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is say, I'm not going to really try to be much better today. You know, that, that makes you worse, doesn't it? Somebody says, well, how does that make you worse? Well, think about it this way. What if there were a big cliff out here somewhere and there was a big group of us that were walking toward that cliff? And you could be 500 yards from that thing. And you could say to yourself, I'm not in any danger at all walking toward that cliff. And that would generally be true. You're still a long way from being affected by that big drop off. But then I suppose there would come a spot where people would start saying, I don't want to get any closer to that thing. There's no guardrail there. What if we went out to the Grand Canyon? And there were these giant cliff and no guardrail. And you say, well, let's, uh, let's just walk over there. Let's just walk over there and see what it looks like. And we all start walking, and all of a sudden people start getting a little more uncomfortable. <laughs> let, let me ask you this. Don't you think that the person who walked closer and closer and closer would be more and more negligent? They would be more and more... Uh, uh, putting themselves in danger of going off the cliff? Well, guess what, friends? We're all walking toward a cliff because our time on this side of eternity is limited. We don't know how much time we have in this life. The Bible says that a man might have three score years and ten or by reason of strength, four score. That's 70 or 80 years old. That was in the days of the psalmist. Not too far from that today. We have good doctors and medicines and sometimes people can get to be older than that. But we're all headed for that proverbial cliff. Now, the question is, when are you going to realize that there's a way to save you from that cliff and do what's necessary in order to take the steps to provide for your safety? This reminds me of one of the very first works that I went to when I left preaching school. I went to a, a congregation out in the country and there was a lady there that uh, brought her husband to services but he had never obeyed the gospel. And she was a hundred years old and he was just a few years younger than her. He was about 98 or 99 years old. And lo and behold, I had been there a little while and she died. And I preached her funeral. I first time I ever preached a funeral for somebody that was over a hundred years old. And I just went back and uh, I just went back in that funeral and talked about some of the things that she had seen invented in her life. And it was pretty amazing. She lived before radio was invented. She lived before Wilbur and Orville flew the first airplane and so forth. And so that was an amazing thing. But after she died, I'd go down and talk to her husband. And he never obeyed the gospel. And I remember one time I went down and had a real serious conversation with him. And I said, what has stopped you, bro, uh, mister, from obeying the gospel all these years? When you came so faithfully with her and brought her when she couldn't drive. And then when neither one of you could drive, you got your daughter to bring you. And you were here at every service. Why haven't you ever become a member of the church and been baptized? And I'll never forget what he said. I'm just not ready yet. 99 years old. You know how close he was to that cliff? He's pretty close because it wasn't very long before he died too. He left unprepared. Why? Because 
He was negligent doing what he needed doing. All of us are walking on that road headed toward that cliff. The question is, are we going to do what we need to do to make sure we're righteous? To make sure that we've been forgiven of our sins. Our slate has been wiped clean by the blood of Jesus. Revelation 1 verse 4, the Bible says, We are washed from our sins in his blood. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says that he has redeemed us through his blood. Have you applied the blood of Jesus to your life? If not, you're getting close to that cliff every day. It's time to make a simple choice. Not always easy, but it is simple. It's a simple choice to make of which ruler we're going to follow. You know, Jesus wants to be your ruler. Matthew 28 and verse number 18, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The, the uh, American Standard says all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. The Bible calls Jesus the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we've already talked about the fact that we need to submit our will to him and let him be our ruler in this life. That's an easy choice to make. A simple choice to make because the other ruler that wants to run your life is the devil. He's been attacking mankind since the Garden of Eden. When he got Eve to sin and she got her husband Adam to sin and because of that they were kicked out and death entered into the world and sin corrupted this world and we've been fighting it ever since depending on the sacrifice of Jesus. The devil wants you. He wants to destroy you. Colossians, uh, 2 Corinthians, rather, chapter 4, verse number 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil is called the God of this world. Why? Not because he created it. Not because he uh, you know, reigns over it as a benevolent dictator, but because he has, he's the one who has the sway here to a large extent on planet Earth. Now, the devil is vicious and cruel and wicked and headed for destruction. He knows what his end is going to be because the devil quotes scripture and the scripture says he's going to be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. The bottomless pit, he's never coming out. The, the, the Lord has already won that battle, but he wants us to be there with him. And that is determined by the choice that we make of who we're going to let rule our lives. Simple choice. It's either the Lord or the devil. The one who died for you or the one who wants you to die for eternity. The one who wants to give you the blessings of heaven or the one who wants to drag you down in that bottomless pit filled with fire and brimstone and punishment and torture for eternity. Simple choice. Simple choice for every one of us. Which ruler are we going to follow? Which road are we going to take? Remember in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus tells us about the broad way and the narrow way. He says, Broad is the gate and wide is the way which leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. That's sadly true, isn't it? Most people in this world are doomed. They don't even feel like it. They feel like they're fine because so many people are walking right, uh, right by their side headed down that road to destruction. The problem is hell's around the, uh, you know, around the, over the hill. You can't see it from where you're walking. They think they're fine. But Jesus says there's also a straight and narrow way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. We, our job is to make sure we're part of that few. It doesn't mean few in the absolute sense. It's not going to be a few of us in heaven. The Bible gives us a glimpse into heaven in the book of Revelation and shows us an innumerable host gathered around the throne of God worshiping. But the point is, compared with everybody who's ever lived, it's relatively few 
that walk that straight and narrow path. It is amazing to me that God leaves it up to us completely which path we're going to choose. He sets them out before us here on this, uh, on this occasion and he wants us to know that the choice is up to us. Are you going to walk that broad path that leads to destruction or are you going to walk that narrow way? It's called a straight and narrow way, by the way. That word straight there in the King James doesn't mean without curves. When we went out to visit our kids in Oklahoma, somebody asked me, uh, what did you see and what didn't you see out there? And I said, uh, well, I, I saw a lot of empty space and I didn't see a lot of curves. <laughs> the roads are all flat, long, and straight out there in that area. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. That word straight means difficult. Sometimes the, the narrow path that leads to heaven is hard to walk because it makes us seem strange to the world. It makes us stand out because we're walking the opposite direction from most people in this world. We're living differently and speaking differently and, uh, and, and choosing different choices in life. Why is that? Because we have already made up our mind to be righteous and to follow the ruler that wants us to go to heaven, to follow Jesus. And so it makes us stand out. Nobody really likes that. Uh, we'd rather fit in if we could probably, but we can't and be a Christian. We have to stand out and be different. And so the narrow way that leads to life, when it comes down to it, we have to make the choice between heaven and hell. There is no third option. That makes the choice very simple, but not very easy. The Bible says, Revelation 20, verses 13 through 15, is where it talks about that lake of fire. But in Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2, it talks about the joys of heaven. It took the Catholics hundreds of years to dream up the idea of purgatory. That is a third option for people to go to, but it doesn't come from the scriptures. Just, that just came from the mind of men, just made up. It's one of those things that maybe it would be nice if it were true, but it's not true. When you leave this place, you're either ready or you're not ready. You're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. You're either saved or you're lost. And that determines, my friends, whether we end up in heaven or hell. The choice is simple, not always easy, but it makes it easier when you're surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ. When you realize that you're joining a great spiritual family with God as the head and everybody here that's a member of the church pulling for you. We want you to make the right choice. We want you to make the simple choice. And we want to make it just as easy as we can. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, and you, and you know you need to be, all it takes is simple obedience to God's plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And if you want to know more about the plan of salvation, we would love to study with you this very day. All you have to do is let us know. If you're here as a Christian and you realize that there's sin standing between you and God, it's the time to come back through repentance and prayer. And if we can pray with you and for you, we'll be happy to do that. If you'll let us know your need, whatever we can do for you, this song is meant to encourage you to make good choices. So do that right now as together we stand and as we sing. Have thine affections with nails to the cross Is thy heart right with God
before the closing prayer, Brother Austin has got a, a quick announcement that he would like to make for us. Appreciate your kind attention for just, just a moment. I just wanted to let everyone know what's going on. What we have been doing with the cards and what we're going to be doing, Rick announced before um, service this morning about the new bulletin board. And, and I would like to thank everyone who has participated in the card ministry. We have mailed, uh, I approximate between 50 and 60 cards to people who are not members of the church, and that is really wonderful. And that is the church in Adairsville being able to make an impact on our community and reach out with the gospel to the lost. So I wanted to explain again quickly to the congregation that when we meet up here on Sunday mornings to send cards out, that that is an outreach ministry and it is with the goal of evangelism in mind. Uh, we're sending those cards to uh, generally to people who are not members of the church. And, and I appreciate everyone who has participated in that. We've had between 10 and 20 people every week participate in that. Now we have a bulletin board that I wish I could take credit for. But Mary has designed and done such a wonderful job. It's a beautiful bulletin board. And it's in this hall right here. So there, at the bottom of the bulletin board, there are names and addresses of people who are members of the church that need cards. They, they need our love to let them know that we're thinking about them and that we're praying for them. There are cards hanging on the bulletin board and at the top there's a manila envelope and a small explanation of what's going on in their, their lives so you can see what am I praying for these people for, why am I right sending them a card and you can just drop the card in that manila envelope so that it can be mailed out. And I would even mention that if you go just a little farther down in the hall, there is a chair and some tables right there. So if you want to just sit down and fill a card out and come back and drop it in the manila envelope, it takes just a few minutes of your time. <clears throat> Having said that, I would like to take just a, a moment to try to encourage everyone to participate in this some way or another. When I was a very young man, someone would often encourage me to participate in things. They would say, you know, won't you come to this, or won't you do this, or won't you help with this? And they were trying to encourage me to serve God more, and I would often respond and say, well, I don't have time to do that. And something that this man said to me, he said, Austin, we're all given 24 hours in a day, and we choose how we spend that time. So I want to encourage everyone here to choose to spend more time serving God. I would like to read to you Romans 5, verses 8 through 10. <clears throat> it says, But God commandeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. <clears throat> I would also like to read Galatians 2.20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If Christ died for us, the least we can do is live for him. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25, verses 33. 4 through 40 gives us the picture of the final judgment and there Jesus it gives us the picture that Jesus will say to people those who have visited me when I was in prison or those who have fed me when I was hungry and people will say back to him Lord when have we done that and his answer is in as much as you have done it unto me excuse me in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren you have done it unto me we're commanded by God to love one another. John chapter 13, verse 35 says, Then Jesus said to them, Excuse me. <coughs> by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And James 2 mentions, it says, you say you have works, 
Show me, excuse me, you say you have faith. I'll, it, it says I'll show you my faith by my works. We have an opportunity here where it's been put together, a lot of work's been put into this bulletin board where we can show our love to one another. Through that we can show the world that we're Christ's disciples. It's an opportunity to serve. And again, I just would encourage anyone and everyone to choose to spend more time serving God. And I appreciate those who are already participating in this ministry. I appreciate your kind attention at this time. We'll close with a prayer. And I also want to say we have someone else to send a card to. So if you're participating in that, when we dismiss after the closing prayer, just come up and, and we'll have some cards out. Thank you so much. Let's all stand and be dismissed.